So, hi there. Hi there. Eventology. Eventology, yeah. Um, <laughs> I skipped all did, the small talk stuff. Yeah, you, you even did that with like an almost French accent. Uh, eventology. Did I? Oh, like, av- yeah. like, that happens to me a lot. Eventology, yeah. I, I don't mind that at all. You're Canadian, you're excused. Mm-hmm. Eventology is the opposite of nomadology. So, um, when it comes to doing uh, history and doing religion, um, you, uh, you obviously have a fundamental story. This is a story of circular time. So if you say Mircea Aliad, the great anthropologist of the 20th century, they, they would all write about circular time as the fundamental time that human beings operate according to. So, you know, every new year, uh, there'll be a new world. Um, so every year is the same. So everything is repeated constantly. This is called circular time. And it's actually how time was understood for hundreds of thousands of years by human beings. And there was really no reason for us to look at time differently from that. Um, and this ties into what we talked about before you and I, which mm-hmm. is nomadology. Can nomadology, I, can I ask, uh, yeah? one thing came to my mind, does that have anything to do with eternal return? Yes, exactly. There's even an uh, Eliad book called The Myth of the Eternal Return. We also know this expression from Nietzsche, of course. Right? The, the eternal return means that everything returns to the same place and then it just repeats itself. And this comes from the origin of religion where every human behavior was seen as some kind of imitation of the gods. Like every act you would do, a god would have done first, or an elderly. Or, or, or your parents, and eventually you. And, and this, of course, ties in with biology and how children are pre-programmed to imitate and mimic their parents. And of course, all human beings mimic all the time. This is a Girard. But um, Mercy Aliad writes about this, like the myth of the eternal return is fundamental to human beings. And this is nomadology, because the, the, the nomadology being the teaching of human beings as a creature constantly on the move means that the nomadic tribe, the sociant, as we call it in our work, this original nomadic tribe, is on the move all the time. Mm-hmm. But it's also on, on the move in a circular way. It returns to the same place. Um, probably because as the nomads were moving according to the seasons. So this is fundamental, circular time. Now what happens is that there is obviously traces of eventology already in the nomadic tribe. Uh, especially shamans would practice something that would be similar to ontology. There's certainly something in the military. Um, so if you were involved in hunting or warfare, you'd be involved in eventology. But it, it, it would end the day you died. So once you transcended and transferred everything onto your, your heritage, onto your sons, um, it would all be repeated anyway. So it'd still be within this sort of the eternal return of the same. But what happens when we start to settle down about 10,000 years ago is that because we don't move any longer, we start to move in the world of ideas. Mm-hmm. And we can't call that nomadology. Mm-hmm. Because once we start to move in the world of ideas, then things do not necessarily have to be the same every year. So mm-hmm. this ties into especially masculine fantasy of the son being different from the father. And a philosopher obviously has written a lot about this, Gilles Deleuze. His most famous book is called Difference Repetition, Difference of Repetition, from the 1960s. He was probably his doctoral thesis originally. But yep. it's an absolutely brilliant book where he discusses uh, Nietzsche's eternal return of the same. And then says it's misunderstood because what Nietzsche means is that with every loop, every turn, it is slightly different from the last turn. Mm-hmm. So there's a small difference. That's why it's called Difference of Repetition. There's a small difference with every loop. Um, in the eternal return. And this difference creates the potential for a different world. Mm -hmm. This is the birth of linear time or phallic time. So Mm -hmm. what happens with Zoroastrianism, which is the first religion to formulate this idea, is that Zoroaster about 3,700 years ago formulates a religion built on linear time alone and saying that cyclical time is the illusion. Linear time is way more interesting or phallic time meaning we can create civilization. Mm -hmm. And civilization obviously is that we improve on everything. We improve on the ideas. We improve on the technologies all the time. We improve on the text. We improve on the art. 
We've proven everything we human beings do. We get more and more advanced. We get more and more sophisticated in what we do. It's not that we change. So Rasta is adamant that we don't change. It's our environment that changes, and we change with it. Mm -hmm. So then process is no longer just process. It becomes process and event. And the word for process this- Process and event. Hmm. Yes. And yeah, you probably know by now that's the working title, the new working title of the book. You, we could call the new book Nomadology and Eventology, but I think process and event makes more sense because it's exactly what it is. Hmm. Philosophically. So, so eventology arrives in history. Obviously, this has also happened in India and China. There are traces of this, of course, in Taoism, of course, in Shaivism in India. So uh, there are several Indian mystical schools as well who go into this idea that there is something that leaves the circular time. The son is different from the father. Mm -hmm. One loop is different from the last one. And this difference in itself creates the possibility of creating a better world. Hmm. So the dream of creating a better world arrives. And without linear time, we couldn't have that dream. Right. But th th two things are happening, aren't they? That we're creating a better world and we're also destroying at the same time. Right? There's a destructive well, and a creative process happening simultaneously, right? Well, I'm not sure we are destroying. Uh, we are obviously living in times that are convinced that we are in apocalyptic times, but mm -hmm. having looked a lot into Bjorn Lomborg's work recently, you know, the Danish guy who is fantastic, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to check out environmentalism, then check the facts and, and go ecotopian. You should definitely check out Bjorn Lomborg. He's amazing. Uh, but Bjorn Lomborg has, has done a lot of research on this and actually come back with the facts. And and his thesis is essentially that the apocalyptic hysteria we experience right now is unfounded and overdone. But in any case, yeah. um, in any case, eventology becomes a parallel way of doing narrative next to nomadology. And I would argue it's not that one of them is right and the other one's wrong. I think we need both. Yeah. And it's gonna unify East and West. We that's the phallic and the matriarch, matriarchal again, is it? Yep. Or yes, phallic and metrical. It's, it's yeah. exactly what this is. So the magical uh, way of events is nomadology and the phallic uh, way of events is eventology. Is so mm -hmm. so uh, what we have then is that we have the linear time religions coming out of Zoroastrianism. I, of course, regard Judaism and Christianity and Islam as increased vulgarizations of the original Zoroastrian religion. Mm -hmm. I'm still a fan of Judaism, I'm not much of a fan of Christianity, and I'm certainly not much of a fan when it comes to Islam. <laughs> But that's, of course, because Christianity and Islam are just popularizations and way more superficial than Zoroastrianism and Judaism were. Uh, and if you, if you want to understand why, then uh, Zoroastrianism and Judaism have the bard absolutely intact. That means there's no direct connection between human beings and God. And that is absolutely fundamental to religion. Whereas Christianity and Islam promise that no, there are no, uh, no limits left. Uh, God and man are now directly connected to one another. And of course, the vulgar version of that is that man becomes God, which is Christianity, and God becomes man, and that's Islam, contrary mm -hmm. to what you think. So um, it's the child God thing, right? It, mm -hmm. It's the idea that child and God are one of the same thing. And the, the, whole, the whole personal nomadology, that you would be a child and one day become an adult and you'd become an, hopefully a parent and then you become an elder and, and if you did, did well and done lucky you could be a forefather or, or foremother, people looked up to you become one of the lesser gods eventually. So, so this whole chain of transcendences that human beings were fostered to live within the original nomadic tribe disappeared and with Christianity and Islam we basically told them no, there, there's no difference between child and God at all. It's not only there's no difference between man and God, but there's no difference between child and God. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why Islam and Christianity running into all the problems that they did. Um, mm -hmm. They were Gnostic religions. Um, mm -hmm. And Gnosticism is the big enemy here. So going back to Zoroastrianism, in Zoroastrianism, you cannot separate body and mind, but rather you, you separate child and grown up. And you separate grown up and elder. And you separate elder and priest or sage. You separate priest and sage from God. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a whole chain here of reporting, you could call it, a hierarchy that is very, very important to stay with. Now, the beauty of that, and this is the reason why Sorastam is the first tolerant universal religion and why our universal human rights today originate from Sorastamism. Not only linear time, but also universal human rights are originally Persian innovations. The reason for this is that so Raster didn't really want to separate eventology from nomadology. He didn't claim like the Christians and the Muslims did that. We must forget about circular time. 
uh, time is stopped because of certain locations. Muhammad rode into Mecca. Uh, Jesus died on the cross. Certain events have changed things forever. There's no more circular time, and there'll be an mm -hmm. end of history. That's you know, kind of the, the, maybe the Abrahamic contempt towards paganism, or well, it is it is originally a mistaking mimicking of Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. Because in Zoroastrianism, you keep both eventology and nomadology. And the reason why you kept both, and the traces you find why you kept both, is that nomadology is being kept as polytheism. Mm -hmm. And eventology is being kept as monotheism. Mm -hmm. And in Zoroastrianism, these were just different layers of thinking, just like they are in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. The different layers of thinking. Uh, monotheism is for the priests, uh, and the split phallus is, of course, for the military. But for the rest of the tribe, for the rest of the community, polytheism is the natural religion. Huh. We can call this the worship of the lesser gods. And the mm. lesser gods are the gods you dare to go to as a human being. Mm. These are the saints. These are the celebrities. These are the idols. These are the icons. The stars. <laughs> yeah, the stars. Well, the stars, yeah. <laughs> so these the are the people you can identify with. They're your older siblings. They're your older brothers, your older sisters. We see them return today in a big way with the YouTubers. You know how much I love the YouTubers, but I think the YouTubers are going to take over the world in the 2020s. They're going to kill politics. They're going to kill academia. They're going to kill all the industry. Haven't because, they already? <laughs> well, they are fast. They're doing that fast. Right. And, and PewDiePie is probably the most powerful person on the planet right now. And nobody gets that. But... I love the YouTubers because the YouTubers are the reinstatement of the lesser gods. Mm -hmm. The new Dem universe. Demigods? Yeah. yeah, demigods. I call them lesser gods. I think lesser gods is a great name. So this is what polytheism is all about. This is what's beautiful with the female spiritual fantasy, with the female religion, magical religion. Magical religion really is the religion of the saints. It is the religion of the direct access. And why mm -hmm. they... It's because the female mind comes up with those ideas. It's, it's a magical way of seeing the world. It's also very circular. Mm -hmm. Daughters have no need to be different from the mothers. Mm -hmm. They give birth to different children anyway. Why would they be different? Why would they raise their children any different from what their mothers did? They don't have to. No, the idea that you're different from your parent is between son and father. It's, it's a phallic fantasy. That's why eventology is tied to the phallic. And why nomadology beautifully is tied to the matrical. And this, of course, why Hinduism ultimately is a very magical religion. Whereas you've got a lot of Indian mysticism that's phallic, or you get Shaivism, but Hinduism in itself is magical. Yeah, now, I don't have a problem with that at all. I, th I think the relationship between Iran and the Indian religion is very, 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 very important. Because what the Iranians understood, what Zoroaster understood, why Zoroastrianism is unique, is because he understood that we can separate eventology and turn that into religion for the military and for the priests. Mm -hmm. So it become phallic. And we mm -hmm. can then have a separate religion that celebrates the woman of the child, the delivery station for the man. And that religion becomes matrical. And that's exactly why in the Persian Empire, none of the Mobids, although they celebrated Ahura Mazda and they celebrated the split phallus, and they were monotheistic. And monotheism was invented by the Persians. But at the same time, you had polytheism. And it was prevalent. It was everywhere, you know, in the bazaars, in the streets, in the towns, in the villages. Uh, people who worship the different local gods, they had goddesses and gods, and these gods and goddesses reflected in the same way that Eliad and Girard are discussing, where they reflected uh, an understanding of the world where the gods would guide you and speak for you and help you and support you, whatever you did, and you had something to mimic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think for people to mimic something, they have to have a direct relationship with a god. Yeah. And if that's one of the lesser gods, which is nomadology is all about. Also, you mimic you mimic the gods when you're younger, right? In a sense. Maybe that's no, what you, is... you mimic your parents. Your parents then mimic the priests and the sages, and the priests and the sages mimic the gods. Meaning, mm -hmm. when you're mimicking a lesser god, you're mimicking a priest or a sage who has passed on, who is above you somewhere else. But that's the equivalent of mimicking a priest and a sage. That means you go to the lesser God, you go to the Ganeshas of the world, you go to the Elvis Presses of the world. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking, that yeah. younger people usually idolize, uh, you know, these lesser gods that you're talking, people in their yeah. 20s, right? When you get to be in your 30s or 40s, you, you don't give a shit so no. much about the lesser gods. But, but Well, you still do. In your but 20s, you're you have to really see them. Yeah. What? 
you still you still do but you're more ignorant of it or you would worship buddha or something like that but you know it's um I mean, this is why we had Buddha and Muhammad and Jesus and Moses and these guys, they were humans. So we had these go-betweens. Uh, they were also worshipped as lesser gods. You're not supposed to worship Muhammad as a god, but you do anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, the lesser gods are incredibly important. Now, obviously, the Catholic Church figured this out quite early and, and turned them into saints. Mm -hmm. So they're idols and icons that you turn them into saints. Mm -hmm. we, we call, we're going to call this iconology in our work to separate it from politism because politism is, is way more than that. It's also the worship of celebrities and stars and things like that. But it's better than to call it just iconology. So what is an iconology? Who do you look up to as a role model when you're a grown up? And who do you try to mimic and become like? You know, uh, who's your role model? Who, who do you train according to? It's called sutra in Buddhism and Hinduism. So mm -hmm. you go into sutra mode, which is who's your role model? How can you mimic that as perfectly as possible? Yeah. And obviously yeah. you do have, yeah, with your parents, you have a, with your a teacher, uh, a teacher is also who are sort of, uh, the teacher is a friend. It's not the same thing as the next level of Vajrayana where the teacher becomes sort of a transmitter of something else. But on the, on, on the Sutrayana le level, the teacher is kind of like a, a role model friend. Yeah. I mean, the Vajrayana, we, we, the teacher is, is something quite different than the role model yeah. friend. It's, it's, it's a different level of transmission. But. but we human beings need somebody to look up to the way children look up to their parents. Yeah. And that's what we need all the time because we mimic. We mimic all the time. That's what we learn things. We have to look up. We, we are. We have, have to, to be look always up. looking up, right? Instead yes. of, you know, looking down. And that's what saints and lesser gods are for. And it's called iconology. And we yeah. must understand that this is fundamental to human beings and to religion. And if we remove that, like we've done in our contemporary society, then we get rock stars and sports stars and other idols. And because they fail so miserably and they're not really worth copying, then we all end up in misery like we have now. After 1945, mediocrity has been the standard for human behavior. And, and of course, we don't ask, why do we mimic these guys? We just mimic them because... We're programmed to find somebody to look up to and mimic. And when, when they fail at their lives, we have this sort of misery we have right now. It, it, we can explain that misery because... Oh, the, the misery Catholic is church. because we have nobody to look up to. That's very interesting. I mean, I've, no, I've noticed that in my, my classes teaching. The, the students don't, don't have, uh, you know, they, they, they have kind of unconscious role models, as you say, but they don't have really powerful people to look up to. Yeah, I mean, at least YouTubers are better than rock stars in that department because you actually talk to them and you listen to them and that's better. So you can hold them responsible for their actions. But let's say at least we understand now what iconology is. We understand how important it is. We understand it's tied into nomadology. It's tied into something fundamentally human and it's called circular time. It's magical. And, and if you really want to study it and understand it fully, we should study Hinduism, right? Mm -hmm. So... But Zoroastrianism keeps this. The only thing Zoroastrianism does, as opposed to Hinduism, is that it switches the emphasis from nomadology to eventology. It just switches emphasis. Oh, uh -huh, I see. Okay. That priority becomes the phallic. That's what I'm talking about. Zoroastrianism is the only phallic monist religion. Hmm. And what I mean with phallic monism is that it's monist in the sense the universe is one and everything is interconnected with everything else. Hinduism believes the same thing. Buddhism believes the same thing. Taoism believes the same thing. It's unthinkable to be dualist in the East. All the, all the, all the major religions of the East are monist, and that's exactly why they win over the Abrahamic faiths today. Because we need to get rid of the whole Gnostic heritage. It's useless these days, because we need to go back to the monist understanding of the world. But we have two options. What Zoroastrianism does is that it shifts to the phallic. Taoism tries to keep the balance between the two. Mm -hmm. That's yang and yin. Whereas Hinduism stays with the yin more. Mm -hmm. so it stays the magical. And Hinduism wisely, in a way, says that, no, no, the phallic is for the military. The phallic is for the yogis. Let's keep the phallic out of the mainstream and let people go and worship their Ganeshas as much as they like. Whereas the yogis mm -hmm. can go worship the Brahman only. Shiva. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or the manifestation mm -hmm. of Brahman. In Shaivism, that would be Shiva, which is phallus. So... Um, so the, the, what I've always argued ever since I started studying Zoroastrianism in the 1980s was that it was completely misunderstood. It, it was interpreted by Westerners as a precursor to Christianity and Islam. Mm 
when in reality Zoroastrianism is an Aryan Indo-European religion. It's a Silk Road religion. It's tantric, it's monist, it's closely related to Taoism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. And I'm finally winning this because there's a whole new generation of especially Iranian American scholars mm -hmm. who totally agree with me. We're going back to the original text, read them in the original Avesta language, compare it to Sanskrit in India, and discover all the similarities. And the only shift you have in Sorastra, Sorastra's reformation, 1700 before Christ, that enables the Persian Empire to prosper for the next 1400 years. That revolution was started by shift from nomadology to eventology. But mm -hmm. the Sorastians never forgot about circular time and they did not ignore nomadology and they didn't wipe out polytheism. They yeah. kept it as a popular folk religion and totally accepted it, which then mm -hmm. later Catholicism had to imitate to save itself, right? So, so that's so like, I was just thinking that's the, the sickness of the West in a way is this, cutting off of polytheism and then having it be yes. repressed, having it be repressed and then, and then manifest itself as pop stars and um, rather than having it being taken seriously. Well, it's kind of, if you mix Sutra and Tantra, you kill both. What? Wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, You've got to keep Sutra and Tantra separate, understand them separately. Mm. Because Sutra, well, well, actually, Sutra is the foundation of Tantra. So even even if it is nomadology is a foundation of eventology. Okay. Yeah. Matriarchy is the foundation of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, circular time is the foundation before we can even dare to think linear time. Mm -hmm. So we have to start there. We have so, to start yeah. the understanding religion. So it's only because we settled down that we can start to imagine that what was previously something the mystics dealt with, the shamans dealt with. And that possibly could be an idea the military or, or the priest could deal with. Suddenly now we settle down, this becomes the dominant mode you can actually aspire to. Mm -hmm. And what this does is that it creates the first theory of empire. It creates the idea that you can have several different peoples, several different, you know, clans and tribes, even nations living together on the one roof. Mm -hmm. That would have been unthinkable unless you had presented eventology as a superior theory to nomadology. Like, okay, we've done nomadology so far in history, we'll keep it as a popular religion, but when it comes to the vision and the strategy of society as a whole, which is an imperial theory, the name mm -hmm. of that religion would be eventology. That's why Zoroastrian is the first religion, probably still the only religion that is a truly imperial religion. That's also why it's the foundation for universal human rights. <laughs> so what the Persians do is that they establish this, right? I'm just laughing because um, that's so against the grain of how people think these days. Because imperialism is is considered to be a great evil, right? And uh, that's ridiculous. Uh -huh. Imperialism is a beautiful idea. I mean, today, how are we gonna save the damn planet unless we go imperial? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Well, imperial just means very big and very great and the greatest possible. Well, we've reached the end of the planet anyway. We, we reached certain end points in history. We went to the moon in 1969. It was a disaster. There was nothing there because we territorially expanded and killed each other on across the entire planet up until that point. And that's exactly why it feels uncomfortable, the territorial expansion up to 1969. Yeah. Because we realized that, oh, there was nothing there to go to. Like Heidegger wrote in 1958, what the satellites told us was that who we were the planet we lived on, and there was nothing else for us to find in space. And that territorial expansion had come to an end. Mm -hmm. So we really now, we, we, what Sorastra's revolution did 3,700 years ago, is we now kick in the second gear of that revolution. The mm -hmm. second gear of that revolution is that, well, now we have no more territory to expand into, even if we permanently settle and colonize, because the, the name for being a nomad while well, you still have a permanent settlement is colonization. Mm -hmm. Colonization is continent. Yeah. That means we have nowhere else to go than our ideas. Uh -huh. right. We have to go more eventological, not less. Mm -hmm. So a return to pure nomadology, the return to paganism is absolutely impossible. We're being forced to rethink eventology. And that's why I, I'm all for a Zoroastrian Renaissance in the sense that if you go back to the origin of the Abrahamic faiths, and if you go back to the origin of Tantra, 
in the East, the tantric monism, which is my favorite, if you go back to the Orange Age, we find a common thread here, and that's along the Silk Route, and it's Persia, and it's the Persian Empire. It's a beautiful place to start, to then realize when the Chinese mimicked the Persians and did right and did wrong, when the Egyptians mimicked the Persians and did right and did wrong, and certainly eventually the Arabs and the Europeans mimicked the Persians and did very wrong. So this is why I think today to understand, uh, make a comparative analysis of America and China today would be the equal, equal of taking antiquity. You know, I argue with John Favarki all the time that he's, he's too much of a fan of the Axial Age. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. the Axial Age is exactly- well, I wanted to come to the Greeks a little bit or-, or to Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when we, come to, when we come to the Axial Age, we've created abundance, we have a period of peace, and we, we've learned to associate periods of peace and prosperity and abundance with, with thinking, right? Hold on a minute. Are you the axial age is a period of peace and abundance wasn't it a period of kind of like um comparatively absolutely okay. yes so that's exactly why there were so many thinkers around and people who walked around and we had gurus all over the place who were very self-indulgent and narcissistic and full of themselves i don't hold these guys as highly as guys that john favari could do i don't i don't hold the greek as highly as it does i think the really interesting shit happened before that during the bronze age and I think that's what we need to go back and make a comparative study of Persian Egypt back then and American China today. You know, I think America is in a big crisis and it's heading in the wrong direction, but it's got one beautiful thing that saves it and it's called the constitution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why? Because the constitution is fundamentally nomadological. Mm. Oh. It's built on a triad. It's built on plurality. Yeah. So American culture is built on plurality freedom of speech, um, you know, and, and this is the opposite of China. China is today's Egypt that has mimicked America, but refused to mimic and, and taking the US constitution. The problem with China, the problem the rest of the world has with China is that we love Taiwan, we love Hong Kong, we love the exiled Chinese, we think they're fantastic. The problem with China itself is that it's communist and it's run as a dictatorship, one man rule, Xi Jinping. The originator of that idea is like Norton in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's 1300 before Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously 400 years after the Zoroastrian Revolution in Persia and after the Zoroastrian Revolution has made its mark in the Middle East. So what Agnaton is doing in Egypt is trying to mimic what the Persians have achieved, but he mm -hmm. does that as a one-man dictatorship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big mistake. Mm -hmm. You need because to. he doesn't, yeah, he's not a Zoroastrian. He doesn't understand you need to split the fallacy, you need to have a strong matriarchy in a society. Mm -hmm. You need to have the matriarchy that holds the patriarchy responsible for its delivery, so you have reproduction in place, and you can then have reincarnation ideas and polytheism, whatever you like within the matriarchy. But on top of that, you have a patriarchy, and the patriarchy is run by split fallacy. You separate the Mobit and the Shah, you separate right. the chieftain and the priest. That's what the Persians were adamant about. They're adamant, the Shtaspa and Sorasta must not be the same person. The Egyptians did not understand this. What Naton created was exactly the, the precursor to this Xi Jinping dictatorship in China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he failed. He stayed in power until he died. His son Tutankhamun inherited it, and eventually Tutankhamun was killed by the priests. Mm -hmm. So it's basically totalitarianism. But, I mean, yeah. And it's very, very like this is the origin of Judaism. Mm -hmm. It's very likely that I wouldn't say Judaism is Atenism, which was like the artist's religion. I would say it's a post atheist cult in Egypt. And if Moses existed, which is likely at least he existed, then Moses was an Egyptian who led an Egyptian cult out of Egypt about 300 years later. So mm -hmm. at 1700 before Christ, you got Zoroaster. At 1300 before Christ, you get Ignaton. You got the failure of Tutankhamun, and he's, he's been killed by the priests. Hey, mm -hmm. does this remind you of Christ on the cross later? Right? Mm -hmm. Mimicking mm -hmm. again. So the origin of Judaism, the origin of Christianity are very similar. It starts with the priests killing the God, mm. the man God. So th 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 this, is, this is what they do in Egypt. And I, we don't know exactly how this went about, but it starts with Cain killing Abel. Cult. Yeah. A post atonist cult eventually leaves Egypt. It arrives eventually in Babylon. In Babylon, it gets mixed with Zoroastrianism. And we talked to you, you and I talked a lot about the love relationship between Zoroastrianism and, 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 and Judaism and the tragedy of why Iran and Israel are not allies today, because historically Persia and Israel have always been allies. And, and what happened with the Zoroastrians and, and the Jews is that the Zoroastrians found an Egyptian cult 
that was sort of independent and very urban in Babylon, and they loved them. And they sponsored the Jews to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and mm -hmm. thereby create a proper nation mm -hmm. inside the Persian Empire. This is the birth of nationalism. Nationalism is the result of imperialism, not the other way around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Imperialism is older than nationalism. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah. And that's exactly why anti Semitism is different from other forms of racism because it's fundamentally a combined nation and religion envy. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, we've never had a better nation than Israel throughout human history. It, the, the nation of Israel, the nation of the Jews, of the Hebrews, has been totally superior to any other nationality before it or after, for that matter, because it is the fundamental unification of nation and religion. Church and state are not separated in Judaism, and that's the beauty of it. The mm -hmm. Zoroastrians didn't separate them either. They separated polytheism from monotheism and allowed both, mm -hmm. as did India. Judaism's problem... So some kind of separation it, has to take place, but... Uh, yes, Judaism's problem is that it tried to kill its magical religion and forced only phallic religion onto the Hebrews. But at least it was split. We, we got the split between Yahweh and El, within Judaism. Every Jewish mm -hmm. mystic would agree. And that is exactly what they either inherited from the Persians and picked up from the Persians, or they've understood after they left Egypt, that this was a necessity. And that's exactly why the Jews say you cannot say God's name, because if you say God's name, you discover there are several names to God, and they're actually different, different faces to God, different applications mm. to God. Yeah. So, um, this is the strength of Judaism, but it's also its weakness, I would say. It, it can only ever be a national religion. It can never be an imperial religion because it doesn't understand that matriarchy needs to be respected as a co-religion with patriarchy. Hmm. The phallic and the matriarchal have to be there together. This is the beauty of India and Iran. Hmm. I would say so that's, kind of the, that's kind of the, uh, the, the Jewish-Christian split as well that you're describing. Yeah. yeah. China has a similar problem to to Christianity in that it split up church and state. And it did so because Confucius eventually became the state and Taoism and Buddhism shared the role of the religion in China. And the problem with that is that statehood is not under religious jurisdiction. That means you can have dictators like Xi Jinping. Um, and, and at the end of the day, if the religion controls the society, you must not have a dictator. You must understand that you split the rule in, into two and eventually into three. Eventually into three. What do you mean? Well, it's, it's, What's the it's third? into three. No, the third is the matriarchy. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 So if you look, if you look at Zoroastrian religion, it has aura and it has master, and then it has the society community in itself. Uh, the also has the goddess Anahita, if you want to bring her into it, but that's the folk religion aspect of it. We don't need that because it's a phallic religion, it puts you on the move. The way Zoroastrian woman would describe it is that she would say that religion in our religion, in Zoroastrianism, is for the men, and women reap the benefits from it. What you cannot have, though, is you cannot have religion only for women, but not for men. Hmm. Isn't that ironic and interesting? So what you get then is that Christianity mimics Judaism and mimics Judaism and tries to go universal. And what it eventually borrows from Zoram is the understanding if you split God into two and eventually into three, you get a triad and it's much more stable over time. And it's exactly about the Trinity. Trinity. Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing with Christianity is that it separates Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, Spirit was way too vague for people to understand. So when you finally arrive with a polytheistic version of Christianity, when Christianity gets its iconology, the Virgin Mary and the Jesus Child arrive in a big way. Mm -hmm. and they become matriarchy within Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then you keep the Father and the Son, and you turn the Holy Spirit into the congregation itself. The strength of Christianity is its nomadological structure. Mm -hmm. That's why it was so stable and has been so successful over time. But the problem is it's built on a mimicking of the birth of Judaism. And, and the illusion here mm, is yeah. that if you have a scapegoat on the cross, like Rene Shiraz, if you get a scapegoat on the cross, scapegoat is once and for all over, and history has changed forever. Mm -hmm. No, That's... that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. What happened is that... Well, it doesn't that, happen. I mean, in, in Gerard's theory, it, it happens gradually over a well, long 
long period of time, not like it doesn't happen. Oh, we that. scapegoat more than ever in contemporary society. And if we left Christianity, it's come back in a big way. I mean, what are these speech polices we got everywhere these days who judge you forever to eternal damnation just for using the wrong word? Mm-hmm. Hey, <laughs> we scapegoat more than ever. We got lynch mobs all over the place in American Europe today. We have not learned a single thing about putting the scapegoat on the cross and the get over the scapegoating thing. So Girard is fundamentally wrong. It failed. But it also failed because in the fifth century, when Christianity should have just, you know, kept its magical aspect, kept stay with the Virgin Mary and the Jesus child, and then added a military religion, which he could have done with Mithraism, added the military religion on top of that for, for the military and for the priest to run. It had a unique chance in the fifth century because the Roman Empire was a dictatorship. Again, the problem is always dictatorships. Yeah. It was a dictatorship. You could only get one throne in Rome, and it became a struggle between the Christians and the Mithras, and the Christians won. And within the next 50 years, Mithras was swept off the planet. You know, it's just swept off the earth. Uh, and we were left with Christianity as the only religion. And since then, the West has proudly declared that we managed to separate church and state. Isn't that wonderful? But in reality, we never managed to separate but that, the two. That is Nietzsche's death of God, isn't it, in, in a sense? Yes, yeah. exactly. Because we get a state, a patriarchal state. We get a military, we get even a priesthood called politics that is without religion. And the reason why the West eventually conquered the rest of the planet and then plundered it and brought us almost extinction. So the death of God, of I'm sorry to interrupt. The death of God is the death of, uh, of the phallus uh, in a sense. Yes, uh, yes, yes, exactly. I never thought of it that way. Um, no, it is the death of the phallus. It happens right in the fifth century. We need to go back there. I mean, we, we, which John Sedeckist and I have done this and did his libido. It's an incredibly dark book. It's prophetic. Unfortunately, it's, it's coming true. But in Diddy's a little bit of we discuss this in detail, but we discuss infantility as a problem after 1945. But in reality, uh, the problem is- Sorry, what word did you use? I, I didn't get 1945. That. What's the word you used? What was the Infa- problem? Infantilism. Infantilism. Infantil- Infantil- you said infantilism. Infantilism. Okay. Infantilism. infantilism. The infan- okay. Infantilization of contemporary society yeah, and yeah. the lack of adulthood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Jordan Peterson's repeated problem starts already in 1945 and mm-hmm. it explodes in the 1950s and explodes with the pop cultural iconology, again, of the failed rock star and the hippies and everything. And, and it, it moved us away from the focus on phallic vision and strategy. And like Peter Thiel and many guys are pointing out right now, this is the ultimate failure of the West. But it goes back further. It goes back to Christianity lacking uh, in the respect of being a, a phallic religion. It's a non-phallic religion. Obviously, if you put the, the guy on the cross and he dies young, you don't even know if he had a sex life or not. You obviously killed the fathers already there. So this is Nietzsche's right that the death of Christ is, historically speaking, now we see the long-term effects, is the death of the phallus and the death of the phallic God. And we can't do without the phallic God. We cannot do without the phallic God. Mm-hmm. We get havoc. So we're there now in apocalyptic times in that sense. We, I, see, I think we see the end of Islam and the end of Christianity. And that's exactly where these two religions have gone fundamentalist and gone aggressive and against each other. And they're trying to make it look as if the only two religions left are Christianity and Islam. But if they want to go eventually towards Armageddon and, and try to kill each other, then so be it. Um, I, I think this is the end game for Christianity and Islam because these religions removed the Bard absolute. And, and that was a big, big mistake. And we need to go back to re-understand religion fundamentally, reinstate the Bard absolute. When I hear you say that, I feel somewhat skeptical that these religions could just end. I, they, they just kind of keep going, don't they? I mean, no. shouldn't they be reformed rather than... than like No, uh, no. 95% of Swedes have told the Christian church to fuck oh, okay. off and oh, okay. die, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, I think what's happening in countries like But they've Sweden, all become, uh, they've all become uh, secularist atheists uh, uh, and feminists and... and... No, but they're not Christians any longer, that's for sure. They've gone back into some kind of weird pagan apocalyptic mode, right? So that, no, the, at the end of the day, we have to take the larger historical picture Mm-hmm. We have to understand human beings as the sociont. The science of that is sociontology. The narrative of that is nomadology. It's a story of circular time. And, and this is how we lived for about 60 to 70,000 years, and our genes were shaped during that period. 
Now what then happened 10,000 years ago is that a mimetic revolution gets started. We have not changed biologically in the last 10,000 years, rather our brains have shrunk and we've become more stupid, but technology exploded. And with technology also culture exploded. And that happened because we settled permanently, we settled permanently because of written language to begin with. Mm -hmm. That meant the idea of eventology could take root and it did in certain parts of the world. And so Raster was unique, probably the smartest guy ever. When he formulated a theory on eventology 3,700 years ago, it's called Gothus. You can read it. If you can read it, the original of Western language even better because the English translations are full of mistakes. But when you go into the understanding of what Zoroaster means and the religion he wants to create that he calls Farash Karti, which is like a state of eternal renewal, a constant renewal. Mm -hmm. This is the idea of civilization itself. Mm -hmm. So we can improve on things. The son can live better than the father did. And because the son creates a better world than the father could, then the daughter can live a better life than the mother can. Mm -hmm. This means we move from nomadology to eventology. And from then on, religion becomes more important than spirituality. The fact that men are religious is more important than, than the women are. So you said that you thought that spirituality is, is, is feminine. And, yeah, uh, and religion but spirituality is, is, is works is in masculine. any case. Women do spirituality wonderfully. They do it all the time. They, 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 the mother teaches the daughter how to become a proper woman. If they can only do that, are allowed to do that the way they should and could, then, then there's no problem. That The problem is with the men. And the problem, that's why we confuse. And we talk about patriarchy in such negative terms and things like that today. Because the men are confused because it was the men who we left without a religion. And not only did we leave without a religion in the West, we left, we left them with a complete misunderstanding of religion called Islam south of the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. because Islam is the absolute mimicking of Judaism, mimicking Zoroastrianism. It's, it's like, okay, can, can you just take a phallic religion and, and worship the military and forget about priests and then have the military conquer the world? And uh, with no respect for, for, for you know, where you're going to arrive. Muhammad was a military genius, but a religious and theological disaster. Hmm. Well. That's, that's how I view Islam. And that's the problem with Islam. And, and the reason, of course, is because I've studied Persian history in detail. And the whole new generation of Iranian American historians, especially now, and new Indian historians are also discovering that it's very important to study the Sassanid Empire, the last Persian Empire, before the, the Persian Empire imploded in the sixth century uh, and Stasifon fell to an Arab invasion. Uh, we must understand that it was hit by a plague and you had several wars against the Christians. So Byzantines and Stephen were in constant warfare with each other. They're both really tired, they were exhausted, uh, they were ruined, more or less, you know, and so the Arab invasion came from the South. The Arab invasion was of course sponsored by Persians who were opposed to the Sassanid Empire. So what happened in the Sassanid Empire was there were several new sects and cults. There, was, there, there were loads of sects and cults flourishing in the Middle East. This was at the same time as Christianity came along. Christianity became popular in the Roman Empire, but in the, in the Persian Empire next door, the two most popular ideas were presented by two guys called Mani and Mastak. And if you study the history of ideas, you know these guys are quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, without Mani and Manichaeism, which was an incredibly popular cult, widespread mm -hmm. in the Central mm -hmm. Asia, Manichaeism. there wouldn't be an Augustine. Augustine mm -hmm. was born as a Manichaean. He officially pronounced himself a Christian before he died. But with Augustine came a lot of Manichaean ideas into Christianity and essentially Christianity became Gnostic after that. Without Augustine, you would never have the separation of church and state the way you did. Yeah. So I think with Augustine, Christianity became a religion of boys and women. You know, and the men and the daughters were forgotten. forgotten. It was all about boys and women. And, and the Gnostic religion it turned into is that Manichaeism was transferred into Christianity and the other cult, which was possibly even worse, was the Mastakite cult in the Persian Empire. Mastak was an incredibly charismatic communist. He was by far the first communist. Stalin loved him, by the way. And when Stalin decided to give the Soviet Union a red flag, he borrowed mm -hmm. the red collar from the Mastakites in the Persian mm -hmm. Empire. Mm -hmm. So the Mastakites were Gnostics. Um, they believed that the soul was way higher than the body. 
and the soul and body should be separated. Uh, man, even more so, but Mastak's version of that was to create a communist utopia. And he went after just about everybody. He forced the upper class and the lower classes to marry each other. He distributed you know, the income, dispersed it, equal, equal outcome for everybody rather than equal opportunity. <laughs> the idea of the equal outcome for everybody starts with Mastak. Huh. Now, that all sounded nice, didn't it? I think any Bernie Saunders fan today probably loves these ideas. Any socialist or communist has loved, has loved these ideas forever. The problem is, is that it creates complete and utter havoc. And the Persian Empire almost fell apart. And finally, it was the Zoroastrian Mobeds, not the Zoroastrian Shahs. It was the priests, mm-hmm. not the generals. It was the priests who decided to go after Mastak and Mani. And they especially went after Mastak. And they basically massacred the Mastakites, knowing that if Gnosticism settles and it takes over the empire, the empire will be over and people will be fucked up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, back in those days... You so, were pretty yeah, so you have the invasion yeah. of Gnostic dualism into Christianity. Um, and into Zoroastrian society as well. And what then happened was that the Gnostics settled on the Arab Peninsula and that became Islam. Islam's origin is masochism. That's exactly why Islam and socialism and communism have so much in common. Look Mm. at the Middle East. It switched from socialism to Islamism in less than 10 years. Why is that so easy? Because the the idea of the Ummah, the only congregation or community that works in the Arab world, the Islamic Ummah is identical to the socialist commune. Hmm. It's the same idea. Wow. So this is the problem. Uh, we know never since that, yeah, as a political alternative, it's okay, we can have a social democracy. But if you install masochism as a dictatorship, you get Stalinism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So I would say that what we inherited from the Middle East, and Europe is only a child of the Middle East. You know, Europe has never been mimicking the Middle East. Middle East is the birth of civilization, and everything in Europe comes from the Middle East. So... Mm-hmm. If you look at these creatures, these guys, Aknaten and Mastak, and look at the dangers of dictatorship and totalitarianism and authoritarianism, what we inherited eventually in Europe, starting with Rousseau in, in, in the 18th century in his fantasies that eventually led to the French Revolution of the Jacobins, uh, that later became Marxism. But Marx, of course, had a different idea than Rousseau, but he was probably a bit naive here. What we eventually ended up with was, of course, Hitler and Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot and these dictators are all mimicking Ignatian and Mastak in different variations of them. Mm-hmm. So they, they're located between these guys. And we haven't learned the lesson that the, the, what religion was meant to do was prevent patriarchy from becoming a dictatorship. That is fundamentally what religion does. Wow. Religion does not allow dictatorship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Religion yeah. is the name of the separation of powers. That's great. I've never thought of that before. That's why I love the U.S. Constitution, because the U.S. Constitution both has heritage going all the way back to Zoroastrianism Hmm. and going back to the best part of Christianity. It mimics the triad here. So it mimics the trinity of Christianity, and it certainly mimics the triad that was preached, taught by the Zoroastrians. Like if, if the guys get their shit together and the priest and the chieftain lead the tribe on the move, and the women can deliver the children at the other end. So mm-hmm. patriarchy, matriarchy work. The way you've done the new constitution is that you replace the chieftain with the president. It's an executive power. Mm-hmm. You replace the priest with the Congress, a legislative power. They set the law. Mm-hmm. That's what priests do. Priests set the regulations. Priests set that you must operate within this regulation. And then you've got a matriarchy holding the other two guys responsible, and it's called the Supreme Court. That's the mm-hmm. elders of America, right? I love mm-hmm. the U.S. Constitution, like the talk will did. And I think if ultimately it, it will save America. It will save probably America, hopefully from war and definitely from becoming a dictatorship. And that's why I put such great hopes to America and why I love guys like Peter Thiel and these guys out there right now trying now to, to reformulate a phallic vision for America and wake America up because America has been asleep for the last 40 or 50 years and become degenerate and decadent. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's at a very, very dangerous place now. And also it become much more unjust than it should have been. Obviously, that is incredibly frustrating too. But that's only a, that's what happens when a society becomes more decadent. And, and people don't care about their own people anymore. Mm, the American yeah. dream is dead and over. 
And I think what Peter Thiel is trying to do is, is he's reading Carl Schmitt, he's reading Leo Strauss, he's reading these guys. You and I are reading Nietzsche and Freud and Jung, and we arrive at the same place. And Jordan Peterson obviously read Nietzsche, Freud and Jung to arrive at the same place too. 